Hey, how you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Glad to have you all here today. Took Brandon down to Maple Shade this week, and it worked out just beautifully. Because I missed all the snow. It was 65 degrees down there, and. Uh, it was a winter wonderland up here. So, anyways, you're looking at an empty nester again, right? Hey, is there any special music today? I know. <laughs> Beth's singing for us today. Yes, Beth is singing for us today. All right, let's see what we have here. Sunday school after service, 1120-ish. Food Pantry February, excuse me. <clears throat> Help us fill the shelves of the Montale Methodist Food Pantry. And uh, we got a nice collection back there. We're running another week, okay? We appreciate everybody's brought stuff in. And uh, let's have a last minute uh, gush next Sunday. <clears throat> Prayer requests here. John Gabert is to have quadruple bypass surgery this week, all right? So that's a biggie. Hopefully he'll be like his dad and uh, dodge these bullets in droves. For John Gabriel, he had a, let's see, there's 17 or 23. I think he had 23 procedures on his heart, you know, between stents and angioplasty and everything else. It was the known record at one time. I don't know if somebody superseded it by now, but so hopefully John, he got the heart thing and maybe he'll get the, you know, uh, ability to get by that. So we need to pray for John Gaber. Family and friends again, if Betty wants Lux Warmoth on her passing, as well as the, the Munleys and the Olsuski family on Jerry's dad. We got Eleanor Matichak on the prayer list. Todd Erb is continuing to recover from his diverticulitis surgery. He's home doing okay. <clears throat> and um, we go down our list. Pittsburgh Second Church of the Week. Mary Jugan Senior of the Week. That's Sarah Kidd, who is the Missionary of the Week. And uh, of course, Children and Youth and Pillage <coughs> Civilization. Boy, we need to pray for um, the world situation and especially those. You know, there's things going on. You got the politic thing, right, with, uh, you know, Putin and all that stuff and the world, so called leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then you got the people who actually live in the Ukraine. We really want to pray for those people. Uh, and their neighborhoods getting shelled, and uh, they're, they're just people like us living on the ground. In fact, I think I said last week, Father uh, Kowalczyk at the um, Orthodox Church up here in Germany, and we went on that church tour. We went and visited all the churches, and the pastor told about the heritage and all that. It was so great to hear him talk. I, I just loved his presentation uh, because he talked about the uh, devoutness of the Russian people. We judge everything by the government and by what, you know, the headlines are. But the people on the ground, the Russian people, are just, uh, there's a lot of faithful Christians there. There's a lot of faithful Christian people in the Ukraine who love the Lord and are deeply, you know, devotional. So we need to keep those people in our prayers. Um, Anybody else this morning? Got a friend who's going to Danville for a consultation this week. Let's keep that in prayer. Anybody else?
Sold. Let us turn in our hymnals to number 54. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing.
nor the destruction that waste that no day. Ten thousand at your right hand. Thank you. May be seated. Excuse me, bow our heads, we have a word of prayer. Our gracious God, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. For all the wonderful things you've brought into our life, for life itself. Because again, if we'd never been, we would have missed so much. It has been magnificent. Just to see the stars, the clouds, the beautiful blue sky, feel the warmth of the sun, I see the wonder of the moon at night. Look out over the ocean. See the animal kingdom and the trees and the forests. And to understand by your very word that you have made us to rule and subdue this planet. You have given us your image, the ability to reason, think, to commune with you, to love and walk with each other. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all you've given us. And our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you count us as a, your children. And a part of that relationship is that we have access to the throne room of God Almighty. The kings of this world, their offices are guarded and protected and there are layers of insulation before you get anywhere near world leaders but the kingdom of God is open to whosoever will and in Christ Jesus we have access to the very throne room of our Father so we come to you and ask you for help we do think first and foremost of this world situation where you know the uh, expansionist or the, 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 the whole deal that's going on over there in Russia and the Ukraine and and the, uh, the way it uh, echoes out and affects, looks like everybody pretty much in the world. We ask you for help with the leaders, Lord. We pray that you raise up leaders who would really consider what's best for the people of this world and not for their immediate interests and not for their special financial interests or their power or their whatever. We pray that you raise up leaders who would do the very best thing for all the people involved. And our Heavenly Father, we pray for the people on the ground. Pray for the Russian people. We pray specifically for the Ukrainian people who are just trying to live their lives in their neighborhoods and in their homes just like we do. And yet they're caught in the jaws of this tug of war that probably amounts to nothing more than somebody wanting the uranium that is in the ground under their feet. The gas and the minerals and the metals and all the wealth and all that that the Ukraine holds and uh, some people, they've got to have that too. And those people who happen to live over that patch of ground, please bless them, protect them, keep them safe. We would thank you that we're here in the United States we happen to be insulated by the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, and so we have largely been able to live a life of peace and without uh, the threat that so much of the world faces all the time. And all we can do is thank you and ask you to help us to be stewards of what you've given us and to live lives that are pleasing to you and take advantage of the great blessings you've given us to enjoy. We pray today, Father, for our friends on the prayer list. We've got people that are going for consultations and we've got people that are recovering from surgery, people anticipating surgery, thinking of John Gabert and uh, again our Heavenly Father quadruple bypass is, uh, I don't think that ever becomes run of the mill, I don't think that ever becomes ordinary. So we pray for John, that you put your hand upon him and comfort him. Lord we love John, he's as gentle and kind as a man as there is, uh, just a good soul. We ask for him and Connie that you watch over them and take care of them and let them live their days out in peace and in happiness with health and take care of them, Father. 
We pray for everybody on this prayer list who needs physical help, healing of various kinds. We ask you to put your hand out and touch them. We also ask you, Father, to get patience and perseverance for situations where healing's going to take some time. And likewise, our Heavenly Father, pray for wisdom and guidance and understanding because uh, our perspective is so limited down here. We are created in the image of God, but we are not a replacement for God. We need to hear from you. We need to commune with you. We need to walk with you. We need your spirit upon us. The wisdom and understanding of God might dwell in our hearts. Guide us from within as we go. Well, thank you for all these things that have been made available in Christ Jesus. We pray for our friends out in Pittsburgh, at the Pittsburgh Second Church. Continue to minister to those souls up there on the hill. And we pray that you fill their lives with happiness and peace and that they might be a draw, that people around them might want to be a part of their family. We pray for our senior of the week, Mary Jude, and put your hand upon her and give her comfort and peace these days. We pray for Sarah and her missionary work. We're so grateful that you have called her. And, you know, again, we feel a kinship with her since uh, her granddad preached from this pulpit for, I think, 12 years. <clears throat> And we ask your blessing upon her and continue to use her for your glory. We pray today for our children and young people in this country that you would call them to yourself and show them what life is really all about. Our Heavenly Father, again, we're very consumed and concerned with philosophies and politics and ideas and uh, what we really need to be concerned with is a fellowship with you. That's all that matters. It makes everything work. So, Father, we pray for our young people. We pray for the pillars of civilization. Once again, law enforcement, military, uh, health workers, uh, government leaders. We pray, Father, that you would give them special wisdom at this time to rise up and bring peace to our world. Our Heavenly Father, we could pray all day, and there's so many things that would be worthy of our prayers. We'll leave these public prayers at that. We'll ask you to hear our voice. Hear our heart as we join our voices together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And now we have special music from one Beth Rupert. If I had only known the last time would be the last time, I would have put off all the things I had to do. I would have stayed a little longer, held on a little tighter. Now what I Yeah. 
Until I'm standing with you in the sun I'll fight this fight and this race I'll run Till I finally see what you can see out to us for all eternity, welcoming, embracing, stabilizing, holding, comforting, drawing our Heavenly Father. We pray that men, women, and children all over the globe might hear the good news of the gospel and receive it under their eternal <coughs> bliss and salvation. The good news is God has left his throne, taken on the form of a man, that whosoever will become a part of the kingdom of God. Would you speak to us about those things here today? Would you help us to appreciate what we have been given and the things that lie before us and the things that lie ahead of us? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've had the birth of Jesus, we've had the temptation of Jesus, we've had the first real kind of glimpse of where we're headed with the rejection of Nazareth, where Jesus' own neighbors, the people he grew up with, his mentors, okay? Your people here in the church, you, you got people who you grew up with and you've had people in the community who you looked up to. Men, women lived up and down, uh, perhaps, you know, obviously parents, but aunts and uncles and neighbors and uh, people you just, they were adults when we were kids. And those kids sat in synagogue one day and watched their adults and neighbors reject Jesus Christ. And these, in many cases, are good people who just don't understand. Do you realize the greatest words, I think perhaps the greatest words that were ever uttered on this planet is when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because that gives us a chance. That opens up the gates of heaven to people just like us. Folks, we're, we're so used to the familiar. We're so used to ourselves that it's hard to imagine how, how little power we really have how little wisdom we really have how little authority we really have we were in complete and utter need of the God who created us to continue to manifest his power in our life and to empower us a vision of course or an idea of that would be our health and uh, you lose your breath. You lose your ability to breathe. What must that be like? 
your heart starts to give out on you and blood can't get through, can't get where it needs to, and the day comes when you can't do anything about it and all the surgery in the world can't help. We are standing in the hands of God and in need of His grace and mercy always. When Jesus came to this world, we were looking for Santa Claus. We want Him to come down from heaven with a big basket of toys, big basket of pleasure, a big basket of relief. And we think it comes in the terms and in the form of the things of the world. But see, those things of this world, they will never ever bring satisfaction. Whether God allows them or not, Jesus came to address sin. That's the real problem. If the sin problem is taken care of, the whole world changes before your very eyes. And it's not so much the world changing, but it's all of a sudden your perspective. And all of a sudden, you're not just limited to this world where, you know, we're going to end up putting a box over here and you're going to lie in there and we're going to say nice words over you and then we're going to close that box, bring it over to the cemetery and bury it. And that's the end. But in Christ Jesus, that just becomes a portal. That's an image. That's a waiting period. That body waiting for resurrection day. Jesus came to change the inside. He'll change that into a portal to heaven. But when we're looking for another gasp of breath, another infusion of cash to cover the bills that are annoying us and bothering us, when we're looking for something that'll take away our immediately felt need. God provides all those things. But Jesus came to make sure we got the real thing, which is forgiveness. As we continue in the Gospel of Luke, last week we saw Jesus commanding a high fever and disappeared from John, uh, from Peter's mother-in-law. He spoke to the fever and it left. Various kinds of diseases. It says in verse 40 of chapter 4, as the sun was setting, those who had it were sick with various kinds of diseases. They brought them to him and he laid his hands on each of them and he cured them. Demons came out shouting, you're the son of God. See, this is what it's really all about. He brings these signs, brings these wonders, and they witness to the fact that He is the Son of God, that He is God in flesh. At daybreak He departed, went to a desert place. Crowds were looking for Him. When they reached Him, they wanted to present, prevent Him from leaving. But He said, I came to preach the kingdom of God in all these small towns up and down the line. I hope you love that. That the kingdom of God is not for the rich and the powerful and the wealthy, but blessed and the poor in spirit. Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The rulers of this world are concerned with their wealth, their power, their authority. They're not looking at sheep. They're looking at being in charge. And that's a road to hell. The road to heaven is to surrender yourself to God and realize it's not about the ground and what's under the ground but it's about the people who walk about this planet. You shepherd those sheep, and you'll find the hand of God upon you. The world will turn against you, because the world's only interested in the things of this world, but God himself promises you in eternity that though you go through suffering and disappointment and pain in this world, which every last one of us will, we don't hear anything about the Kim Jong-un anymore, do we? Remember when he was in the news a few years ago? We were going to go to war with Korea, and uh, he was Rocket Man, and all this was going on. and He's kind of disappeared from the page, hasn't he? Last we heard, he was having tremendous health issues. Last heard, 
Some people speculated he might have died. Because the biggest, the strongest, the most important man who ever walked this planet, save Jesus Christ, is going to die the death of the poorest, the smallest, and the meanest, that is to say the least. Jesus came to say, the kingdom of heaven is open for you, and it doesn't have to end in death, and it doesn't have to end here. I got things prepared for you that your eye has never seen, your ear has never heard, your greatest thoughts, your greatest visions, your greatest dreams of heaven. Don't approximate what I have prepared for you. Listen to this. Well, that Jesus was in one of the cities, I like the way it says in the New Revised, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out from them. They were washing their nets. And just think about it. You got Jesus is preaching here. Uh, sort of a situation like this. Uh, you know, if, if I'm up in, a, in the lake, I'm actually in the water here. Jesus starts out preaching there on the other side of the, the uh, altar rail here. He's preaching from dry ground. And over here, you got James and Peter and John and probably Peter's brother Andrew, <coughs> fishermen, and they're over there, they're cleaning their nets. They're getting all the seaweed out of there and looking around to find out where there might be holes in the net, and they can mend them, and, and they're just worried about getting the, day, the job done. They've been out in the lake all night and caught anything. Well, let's call it a day, or let's call it a night, as it were, we'll bring the nets in, we're not catching anything but a cold. Let's just clean these nets up and we'll go back out tomorrow and hopefully we get something a little bit better. Well, Jesus looks out and he sees a couple of their boats. And it says, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him, Simon is Peter, by the way, he asked him to pull him out a little bit from the land. And so he sat down in that boat and he taught the people from the boat. So now he's out in the water and the people are crowded all around, amphitheater, you know, like. And Jesus starts teaching. And it says when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep. Here's your boat back, Peter. You take it back out into the lake. Let down the nets for a catch. Now think about what Simon said. He said, Master, we toiled all night, and we took nothing. Yet at your world, word, I will let down the nets. Now, we're reading this out of a text, but I wonder what was going through Peter's mind as that happened. Because I know what would go through my mind. Uh, if I had been fishing all night and caught nothing, and I was reduced to just washing the nets, and we'll try tomorrow, and... And now Jesus is speaking, and of course, he's the public figure, he's the authority. He's a little different than Mom, because when Mom would say, yeah, well, why don't you go out and do this? And I'd say, well, I was already doing it, it can't be done. Uh, I got the ice chipper this last night, put some melt ice on that, uh, ice going around the side of the church, and then I look around on the side, there's a big hump, and it's just going to take too much work, can't get it done. I'm just going to have to let it go. And then somebody says, well, if you really were committed, you'd go out there and do that. And you think to yourself, yeah, right. Um, you kind of resent being told to go back out and do what you've already been doing. And uh, they don't realize what's going on. or They don't know how much I did or this or that. But Peter says, well, he says, well, even though we've been out all night, Master, and we took nothing, if you want, I think it was words of resignation. We'll go out and drop the nets. <coughs> and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were splitting. The nets were bursting. <coughs> 
And in the midst of it, they signaled their partners in the other boat. And they came to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, just think, we've been out all night, we can't catch a thing. Go out and put the net in. All right, Master, we were out all night. He goes out, puts it in. Now that thing has taken in water. It's drowning. It's just being submerged. And after hearing, we don't know what Jesus was teaching on the shore that day, but whatever he was saying, and whatever Peter just experienced, <coughs> got his attention. And it says, Simon Peter saw that he fell down at Jesus' knees in a prostrate, worshiping posture, and said what? Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon. I love that. He says, Lord, this catch of fish drops Peter to his knees, and now he's asking for forgiveness or saying, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. What Peter experienced was so astonishing. The same word is used in the book of Acts. Remember when uh, Peter and John were going into the temple one day and there was a man sitting there. He was a beggar. He was crippled. He couldn't do anything. He was lame, you know, his whole life. And he's been reduced to a career of begging. Just sitting there next to the temple, hoping somebody will give him some money. And James and John walk up and say, uh, and, and he's all anxious. He thinks, oh good, maybe these guys will give me something. And James and John, or excuse me, Peter and John look at him and Peter says, you know what, we don't have any money to give you. We don't have any silver or gold, but what we do have, stand up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And that man who had spent his whole life lame, his whole life begging, when he was a little boy, when he was a little child, his parents prayed and hoped and wished and wondered and take, took him to all the best people around to see if they could do something to help that little boy. But nobody could do anything to help him. And then he got to the years where kids were running and playing and he had to just maybe sit and watch or maybe mom just kept him nearby because he didn't want him, the kid to feel bad that he doesn't have the ability to be like all the other kids. And kids start taking up trades and start working with their dads and start making a living for themselves and participating in the world. And that kid's left behind. Talk about depression. Talk about disappointment. Talk about frustration. Talk about the things that destroy a person's self-confidence. This individual had it congenitively, congen congenially, congenially, you know what I mean? <laughs> From the time of his birth, this kid's been the loser who sits and watches everybody else do. And he just dragged around and sat there somewhere to beg. And now he sits there and Peter and John come and he doesn't think to himself, oh my gosh, these are the ones that are with Christ. These are the ones that are <clears throat> friends of Jesus. No, he's looking and he's still thinking in beggar's terms. And he just looks at them and he thinks, oh, I'm going to get some money. I hope they'll give me something. And then Peter and John say the words that are so encouraging. Well, I don't have any money for you. And that guy's heart drops. But I do have this. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And that lifetime loser, that lifetime cripple, that lifetime beggar, that lifetime who's watched the whole world walk by him, and how are you when the Salvation Army kettles out? How are you? Why well, don't I never have cash? We, we, have, we do everything with a credit card nowadays. When I had money, I'd put it in there. If I had something, I'd give it to them. But when you're just walking by with a credit card, something over there catches your attention, doesn't it? Or maybe you say good day to the guy and you think, 
ah, he does this all the time. I hope he understands that because I don't want to tell him the whole thing. I don't, sorry, I don't have any cash. All I got is a credit card and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You feel uncomfortable about it. And that man <coughs> has watched the world walk by and he has made everybody who's walked by him feel uncomfortable. And now all of a sudden he gets up. And the Bible says he's running through the temple. It says he's skipping and jumping. And the people are looking on and the word they, 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 they were astonished. They can't believe what they're seeing. This is something that you don't see. <coughs> That's the same thing that happened to Peter and all the people around. Over a catch of fish. They looked at the situation and thought, a higher power has just arrived. This Jesus, he's been telling fevers to leave people, and they leave. They bring everybody to his doorstep at night, and he don't heal this one because they have faith, but I can't help you. You don't have faith to be healed. And this one, you're going to have to see a specialist. And this one, let's run some tests and find out what's really wrong. It's, you're healed, my friend. Go and look at the world that you've never seen before through the eyes that were blind. And you, my friend, you've never heard the voice of your mother or father who stood there and watched them trying to get you to understand through hands. Listen to my voice. Go listen to the birds. And listen to the world go on around you. And this man, you who can't do anything, Get up and walk. And he's running and skipping, and the people are stunned. Peter looks at that boat sinking full of fish, and in that fisherman's mind starts rolling and starts calculating and saying to himself, I've been on this lake my whole life. I know when fish are, and I know when fish aren't. And I know when it's time to pull in the nets, and I know when it's time to throw out the nets. This man just told me to do something that never happens. And it just happened. And he goes, and what does he say to Jesus? Oh, you must be the Messiah. Thanks for all the fish. No, he goes and says, I sense I'm in the presence of God. And I feel so unclean and so unholy. Jesus, depart from me, for you're a, I'm a sinful man. And what did Jesus look at him and say? You're right, Peter, you are a sinful man. You're a fisherman. You're a guy who hangs around the docks. You ain't afraid of, you got a vulgar, foul mouth. You talk like the fishermen do. You talk like they do on the wharf. You act like people who've been around the wharfs and the docks your whole life. You're right, Peter, you are a sinful man. You better get away from me because I'm pretty holy. I happen to be the Son of God. No, he didn't look at that at all. He looked at him and said, Peter, <clears throat> don't be afraid. He looks at you and me, and he says, I know everything about you. And if I shine the light on you, humiliation and embarrassment would be the result. But don't be afraid, because I'm not here to humiliate and embarrass. I'm here to seek and to save the lost. I'm here looking for people just like you. I know your feelings of insecurity. I know your feelings of frustration. I know your feelings of lostness. I know the things that have taken place in your life that brought disappointment that you just absorbed and accepted and you just walk with it and live with it and wonder why me? Everybody else seems to be so prosperous, but here I am just slogging along. I know about it all. I know everything about you, but don't be afraid, because I came here to embrace and not to send away. He says, don't be afraid from now on. I love the word catching. You'll be catching men. And, you know, the other gospels, some say fisher of men, but the word here is actually the word, you'll be taking them alive. You'll go to men and you'll take them alive. Not like a fish, when you take him, he's going to be dead. No, 
you're going to go and you're going to catch men and you're going to take them alive because what I'm giving you, Peter, is new life. It's the thing that will take you, like I said, beyond that casket. It's the thing that will take you beyond that cancer. It's the thing that will take you beyond that heart that is going to fail one day or another. And you can clear out the carotids all you want. You can clear out the plaque and all the other stuff. But sooner or later, one day, we're all going to wear down and run out. But Peter, what I'm giving you is real life. And Peter, you can share it with the whole world. You can share it with your kids. You can share it with your neighbors. You can share it with your husbands, with your wife, with your grandchildren. That's taking the message to the world. We think, oh, I have to be a witness for Jesus. That means i got to go down and stand in front of Walmart and buttonhole everybody who comes by where I'm really not doing what I ought to be doing. And if you ever stood down at Walmart and buttonholed everybody who walked by, it's uh, not comfortable for anybody involved. And it doesn't work. I don't know how many doors I knocked on when I first started in the ministry. Even before that, I used to go with guys in Johnson City and they, they meaning well, they'd knock on doors. We got a Sunday school, want to come. We didn't even tell them the gospel. We just would say, we've got a Sunday school, hoping to get their kids into church. And went door to door with Tom Watkins out in the Pittsburgh area and had some good stories to tell. But not a single soul ever came to church. And we've had so many events in the church, we thought, oh, we'll, we'll have a free dinner and it'll bring in some new people maybe. Or we'll have vacation Bible school and we'll have 92 kids here and it'll bring in some new people. Or we'll give away this or we'll do that or we'll stand out in the corner and hand out water. And when the smoke clears, it doesn't draw. I think we've decided here, I think, and I know I think, that uh, if you want to do something nice for somebody, do something nice for somebody to be nice. Okay? You want to teach Sunday school, teach Sunday school, teach Sunday school. Don't hope you're going to get something else out of it. Just do it for what it is. And if you get something, man, that's crazy. Man, that's over the top. But you just be who you're going to be. The bottom line is, your greatest witness, you've heard it a million times, but it's the rock bottom truth. It's the life you live. It's the example you set. It's the way people see you behave. <laughs> You live the right life. You behave the way you know you should. The whole world's not going to fall at your feet and say, I'm a sinful man. How do I get saved? But someone might. Most of the world's going to go the way of the world. And they always will. Do you realize what Jesus said? He said the road to perdition, it's real wide. And a lot of people are going to take that easy road right to perdition. That's hell. But the road to the kingdom of God is narrow. And he said few people are going to find it. And when all the giveaways are over, and when Jesus stops being Santa Claus, who just comes with a bucket of toys, when Jesus comes to address sin in your heart, most of the world is not interested in that. Because most of the world, their sin problem is really somebody else's. Or it's really something God has done. Or it's their circumstances or situations. And so God sent his son into this world, not with a bucket of toys, but to draw attention to people. And when it drew the attention of those who had ears to hear, Peter comes and falls at his feet. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. You're going to go catch men. And when he brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They found something that the world could never match. You know, one more. There's a woman in the world. There a woman came to Jesus one day. It says here, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus, come on over to my house for dinner. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he took his place at the table. 
And a woman in the city who was a sinner. That's the description. A woman who was in the city who was a sinner. Do you know that person? No, not us. We're not women who are in the city and sinners. <clears throat> We're church people. We're not really considered sinners, are we? A woman from the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and she began to bathe his feet. I love it. Bathe his feet. Soak her his feet with her tears. I put these boots on this morning, right? And when I put them on, I don't wear socks inside the boots. And so what that means is uh, when your foot sweats, okay, uh, these boots are really tight. And so you know what you got to do? Better than socks, put some powder in there. It lubricates, absorbs moisture. The boot goes in, feels dry, feels comfortable. And the boot will come off when you're ready to take it off. You need a little help there. You need to bathe your feet with something. She bathed his feet with her tears. <coughs> and she was drying them with her hair. Get the picture? She's described as a woman of the city. Okay? Who was a sinner. She's on her knees at Jesus' feet, crying on his feet, wiping her his feet with her hair, this sinful woman of the city. And the scribes and Pharisees look over from the side and think, this man's a prophet. He's got this woman of the city who's a sinner, and she's wiping his feet with her hair. What kind of prophet would accept such behavior? First of all, she's a woman of the city and a sinner. He should send her away. I guess like he should have sent Peter away. You know, the man who said, I'm a sinful man, would you please leave me? But instead, Jesus let her weep over his feet. Because what those people saw was far different than what was going on. What's going on in their hearts and minds is something unclean. Something untoward is happening here. Ah, just like all the rest of them. Got the woman on the side. And here the sinner of the city. We see her in action. The Lord only knows what goes on behind the scenes. Right? That's what they're thinking. And Jesus said, well, you know what, Simon? I see it written all over you. Now this isn't Simon Peter, this is Simon the Pharisee. He says, uh, I got a question for you. Certain creditor had two, de two debtors. One owed 500 days wages. 500 days wages. He'd have to work a year and a half and give everything he earned to pay it off and he wouldn't have one penny for his family, for his food, for anything else. Every single penny he earned for a year and a half, pay off that debt. And the other guy, he only owed 50. Now, when they couldn't pay, this man canceled their debts for both of them. Which do you suppose would love that guy more who canceled the debts? And of course, the Pharisees said, well, in our esteemed judgment, we were educated, we know what we're talking about, unlike you in those uneducated followers, those fishermen, this woman, obviously the one who was forgiven the 500. And Jesus said, boy, are you right? You have judged rightly. And then he turned to the woman. And he said to Simon, as he looks at the woman, he says, you see this woman here? I entered your house. You didn't give me anything to wash my feet with. That's just customary. He's talking, he's looking at the woman while he's talking to this guy over here. Customary for you to give me water to wash my feet. Get the dust off. Walking through these dirty streets with sandals. 
just make me a little comfortable. So when I lay down on your, you know, on my elbow at your dinner table and my feet are near this guy here, you don't have dirty feet in front of him. They're nice and clean. Everybody's happy. But you didn't bother with that. You really aren't even interested in me being here. This is kind of a novelty, but what you're really doing is hoping you can exclude me from the circle. You didn't give me a kiss, you know, like they customarily do in the Far East and in European places, but from the time I came in, she hasn't stopped kissing me. And she's kissing my feet. And he says, you didn't give me any oil to anoint my head, nothing to refresh me. But she's anointed my feet with her expensive ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she's shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, they don't love very much. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith is saved, you go in peace. And that lone woman left forgiven, left saved, left a child of God. And the skeptics sit over here stewing in their own juices with nothing to be grateful for because she's the sinner, not them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. And our Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our eyes. We give ourselves the mulligans all the time. The things we do that are really wrong. And we don't need a definition of sin. And we don't need, you know, to buy a three-volume theology to figure out what is it is a sin. We know in our hearts. But we forgive ourselves very easily. And we dismiss ours as errors, mistakes, as, well, it's some line we had across for the greater good. And we let ourselves go all the time. But boy, when we see it in others, it's uh, neon light over there. Would you speak to us about this? Would you get our attention just like you did, Peter? We don't have to have the net of fish burst and the boat be swamped to get the picture. All we need to do is look in our hearts and change our minds about who is our Lord and Master. Because if Jesus Christ is our Savior, our sins are forgiven. If anybody else is our Lord and Master or anything else, our sins will not be forgiven. Would you speak to us about this? He is the only name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, would you turn with me? I'm pausing to 422. We'll sing the first verse. Just like what we just sang. 
we don't have to go to Africa, we don't have to go to Australia, we don't have to go to Siberia. We need to go to Jesus and talk to him and fellowship with him and let his light illuminate our lives as we become children of God, not just in name only, but also indeed genuine disciples. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.